Vamos começar então para nos atrasarmos mais, se não se importam. Um, I would like to welcome uh, Morgan Meyer. Um, I don't know if you had time to look at uh, the CV of our invited speaker. He is a biologist and she moved then to sociology and he is working um, right now uh, at the Agro Paris Tech. And One of uh, his main concerns is about what he call knowledge brokering or knowledge brokers. Um, I saw one paper, I don't know if it was the first one about this theme, but uh, a few years ago I found um, a paper that was called The Rise of Knowledge Brokers, I think. Um, and well, The idea catch my attention. I think lots of people have seen that paper. At least I have discussed that paper with uh, some students. I know that the Finca Pesh in Lisbon had already discussed this paper. So we decided to invite Morgan to talk about this theme. He has, I think they are from the last year, uh, two new papers about the theme. So please. Welcome and thank you for accepting the invitation. So thanks for the invitation, thanks for having me and thanks for picking me up at the airport. I felt almost like a rock star, so it's <laughs> very nice to be here. So I will talk today about uh, this idea of knowledge brokering or The, the idea that you have intermediaries which translate and move knowledge between different, different worlds. And I want to start with uh, this article. This is an article um, which has been published in a journal Science. So uh, this was two years ago and a journalist from Science uh, uh, emailed me and asked me if she could do an interview about uh, knowledge brokering. So she interviewed uh, a couple of people who are themselves called knowledge brokers and I also participated in this uh, in, in this interview and she was interested in this because in her eyes and in the eyes of many people this is an emerging profession that there are more and more people who call themselves knowledge brokers who try to communicate science to translate science to make science more accessible and usable for a, a wider public And so this has been um, an increasing interest in, in journals like uh, Science, but also here's a, a picture from a conference which was organized three years ago uh, in London, and there were something like 200 delegates, and I think this was one of the, the, the first really big international conferences dedicated to, to knowledge brokering. And so you had people from industry, people from academia, people from... Um, We had uh, journalists, so it was a wide mix of people who are interested in, in knowledge brokering. So the term uh, is at once interesting but also a bit problematic because knowledge brokering is used in a variety of domains and areas. You have people using the domain, the, using the term to talk about knowledge brokering in business or in the, in the legal world. You have people using the term to talk about brokering between uh, health and doctors and scientists. If you look at images um, depicting knowledge brokering, you'd often see things like this, uh, uh, a bridge, a bridge which um, brings together two people. I'm looking for this. So. So the idea of, of building bridges between different worlds. And I will come back to this, uh, to this image or metaphor of the bridge at, towards the end of my talk. Or shaking hands, uh, this idea of mediating. Uh, and here is one, uh, one of the, the famous knowledge brokers called Alex Bilak, who is himself a knowledge broker, but who has also published works on, on knowledge brokering. So today I will talk um, I will present you what knowledge brokers do and how they work. And so my, my talk is divided into four parts. The first part will uh, try to think about what a knowledge broker is and how we can define 
and think about knowledge brokering. Then I will move on to talk about the practices of knowledge brokering and the movements that knowledge brokers do. And in the third part, I will try to think about what happens to knowledge when knowledge is brokered. And then to conclude, I will say a few words about intermediation. So first, what is a knowledge broker? And um, I've put also uh, uh, a, a translation, and I've had discussions with several people of you, and it is quite, uh, quite difficult to, to translate a term. Um, in English, it works quite well. Uh, knowledge brokering is a term used in, in the UK, in the US, uh, above all in, in Canada. But um, in translate, translating it into French doesn't really work. And I don't think also this is a very uh, adequate uh, uh, translation, but it's probably the best translation you'd have. So, uh, in intermediary de conoscimento. Um, would, that, would, would that make sense? Uh, yeah, okay. We have a discussion about that. Okay, yeah, good, good. And um, so I'll give you one definition of this guy. I just showed you a, a picture of Alex Bilek and his colleagues. And uh, he said that, I'll, I'll quote, knowledge brokering is typically used to refer to processes used by intermediaries, knowledge brokers, in mediating between sources, sources of knowledge, research, and users of knowledge. And this involves bringing people together, helping to build links, and identifying gaps and needs and sharing ideas. But this is just one, uh, one possible definition of knowledge brokering. And people have different, different uh, definitions according to, to what kind of practices they describe and how themselves uh, they have been involved in knowledge brokering. And it's interesting to see that um, the term has been used rather recently, has become more and more prominent in recent years, and especially from the year 2000 onwards. And it's been used, as I said, in a variety of fields to talk about innovation, to talk about management, uh, to talk about the relationship between science and policy, um, or the relationship between uh, science and knowledge and, and health and doctors. Uh, but also uh, in recent years to talk about science communication. And um, one key actor which has um, played an important role to think about knowledge brokering is uh, a Canadian actor called the Canadian Health Services Research Foundation, which has been doing workshops and which has published a couple of papers in 2003 and 2004. They even have a, a newsletter dedicated to knowledge brokering. And, and so this is one of the, the, the first places where knowledge brokering has been defined and, and thought of. Um, and so you see here, I, I did this, um, this uh, graphic a couple of years ago, and, and so since 2000, but especially from 2004 or 5 onwards, you see uh, an increase in, in, in academic publications on uh, knowledge brokering. I've put the figure five, 500 academic papers, it depends on where you look, if you look at uh, the Scopus database or the Web of Knowledge, you would find five, six hundred papers. And if you look at Skuglugola, depending on how you look for papers on knowledge brokering, you find four, five, six thousand uh, papers. And here are just some, uh, if you would like to know more about knowledge brokering, here is just some literature on, on knowledge brokering. The first definition I, I showed you is from, from, from that paper. Uh, the Canadian Health Services Research Foundation did uh, this paper, which is often quoted and referred to. And there are several other, other papers. And I just want to point the attention also to the work of several colleagues who have been working and who have been acting also as knowledge brokers. Uh, Vicky Ward uh, at the University uh, of Leeds, Christine Knight at the University of Edinburgh, and Lawrence Clegg's at the University of uh, Wageningen in, in the Netherlands. And it's interesting, I will also quote some of their work, it's interesting that those people have been working as knowledge brokers and then have been thinking about what knowledge brokering is. And there have been two special issues published last year. Uh, one I did with a colleague in Science and Public Policy, and the other one uh, done by colleagues from Edinburgh in Evidence and Policy, and both are about knowledge brokering and intermediaries. So knowledge brokers, um, to give a very succinct and short definition, 
uh, can be seen as either people or institutions who move knowledge around and who try to translate knowledge and create connections between the researchers or those who produce knowledge and their different audiences. Might that be the wider public, uh, might that be policy, uh, might that be the, the policy world. And um, so I looked at the literature and the term is used to describe quite a wide uh, uh, variety of institutions. Um, the term has been used to describe science shops uh, as also a place which brokers between the university and civil society. The term has been used also to talk about technology transfer offices, which are also institutions uh, uh, trying to make a link between universities and the industry. But also uh, the term has been used in, in health and, uh, and, and in other places. And so since roughly 10 years, um, there have been more and more uh, knowledge brokers um, who, so there have been more and more people who describe themselves as knowledge brokers. And you also see uh, an, in, in, an increasing institutionalization. So we have specific spaces which are dedicated to knowledge brokering. Um, and so this practice is becoming more and more prominent. I showed you the, the, the conference. Um, you'd see more and more job advertisements, uh, especially in, in the UK and the US and in Canada, about knowledge brokers. Uh, and one of the challenges for these knowledge brokers is, um, while it is quite a recent uh, profession and an emerging profession, and um, it is still not very much recognized and not very much planned. And the knowledge brokers themselves who are interviewed, they say that there is a lack of support and training to do this kind of, uh, of work. Knowledge brokering tends to happen backstage, so it's not something which is published in uh, academic journals, or uh, they don't normally give papers, or they don't do, do presentations at conferences, uh, but it's something which happens uh, rather behind the scenes and is often invisible. And it can be something like uh, organizing meetings or exchanging uh, emails, making phone calls. Um, so it, it's all this kind of invisible work uh, which is important to communicate and translate knowledge, but which is sometimes not really visible and valued. And this is especially uh, problematic if um, you all know about how research is evaluated and all the emphasis put on publications and impact and so uh, a lot of these knowledge brokers, they struggle uh, to really show the value of their work because what is normally valued is uh, citation counts and, and impact factors and patents. And here is one uh, blog post from Lawrence Clegg's. And uh, so there has been a, a, a lively discussion going on on a forum dedicated to knowledge broker, so the knowledge brokers forum. And he said one of the problems is uh, uh, the, 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 the dilemma of taking credit because um, uh, I, I quote if you already succeeded in making your role visible you should not attribute too much of the success to your actions as the network partners you stand in between will say you are claiming successes they have achieved or they have already forgotten you put the seed for success bringing them together on the other hand if you do not clearly show your value you are seeing as noise in the relationship. You won't get funding or your funding will be withdrawn. So how loud should you yell about how important you are? And this, I think, uh, summarizes quite nicely uh, uh, some of the challenges of, of knowledge brokering, the, the, the idea of evaluation, valuation, and taking credit for, for what, knowledge brokering, what knowledge brokers do. So I move to the, the second part. So what do knowledge brokers do? And I did a couple of interviews uh, with people uh, in, in the UK and in France. And so um, I wanted to their views about what knowledge brokers do, wh what is it they are uh, doing with knowledge and to knowledge. And um, when I started to do my research, I, when I looked into, into the literature, uh, knowledge brokers were usually described as people who are in between two worlds. So they are sometimes described as go-between. So you have the world of research or science, and you have the various publics, and what knowledge brokers do is they move between those different worlds. But what I found out when I did my interviews and, 
and analyze what knowledge brokers do. Um, actually, they do much more than this, and uh, they are doing many more movements than just moving between two different or existing worlds. And so I was, I was interested in doing some research on this kind of positioning and situating and how people think about their movements and their translations. And so, um, first of all, uh, when, when people try to broker knowledge, um, one thing that always comes up, and this is uh, a knowledge broker from uh, the University of Leeds talking, that the first uh, stage is about listening and trying to formulate problems. And so, um, this is our two quotes. Uh, the first one is from a knowledge broker, Vicky Ward from the University of Leeds. And, and she, she says, well, it is knowledge broking. First of all, it is about listening. And you have to have people explain things to you. And then I interviewed some people who she, she's worked with who also confirmed that she was very good at listening. And at the end, uh, they tried together to develop a formulation. So the, the, the first stage, if you will, or the first movement is that you have to uh, describe a problem or describe the knowledge needs and try to to make them uh, explicit. And so you have to turn a problem or a knowledge gap into a doable problem. So this would be the, 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 first, uh, the first stage. And then, uh, of course, you would also see descriptions uh, which refer to this idea of moving in between. And, and so these are several quotes from, uh, from the interviews I did. And this idea of walking in between is very much present and is very much uh, important. And people say that they are facilitating interactions between different worlds. They are mediating between different kinds of participants and moving backwards and forwards. Sometimes they describe themselves as third parties or, um, who look both ways and sometimes who, who are able to speak two languages or are bilingual. But this is, I would say, the, the classic view of what knowledge brokering is, so an intermediary uh, 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 who moves in between two worlds. But what also uh, the actors said, uh, which I found even more interesting, is that it's not only about moving in between, but it's also, in a sense, moving along with or alongside actors. And, uh, and a lot of people talk about being a catalyst or being a coach or facilitator. And so here is just one quote um, who describes the knowledge brokering as, as the idea of playing like, uh, playing, uh, being a coach. So it's about listening and understanding where people want to be and then walking alongside them. Another quote has it like this, brokering is a catalyst for knowledge transfer. So this is a, a, a quite interesting relationship. So it's um, not only moving in between, but walking with people on a path which leads to change and learning and new, new practices and new processes. And then, um, which is also interesting, is that at the end of all these processes, knowledge brokers uh, sometimes also move away or detach themselves from their, their, their practices. And they say, well, you do your brokering, you try to translate uh, knowledge, get people to work together, and then, in a sense, get out of the way. And then well, one knowledge broker described this as making yourself redundant. And then so she said, well, it has to be self-sustainable. People, after having met other people and uh, translated knowledge, the idea is that you, as a knowledge broker, you're not needed anymore. So um, the broker's work can be described as helping people to become more able to do this kind of work uh, for ourselves in the future. And so this is um, um, this is not only this not not only means that brokers move in between worlds but um, they have various kinds of relationships with the actors. So they get to know actors, they move into a relationship, and so they try to build trust relationships, organize meetings, uh, uh, translate, transfer, move knowledge around, but also detach themselves. And I find this a quite interesting uh, relationships in terms of, uh, in, in, in sociological terms, that 
you do things together, you attach yourself to actors, and then you detach yourself from, from those same actors. And this is what makes knowledge brokering work, and this is, can be seen as the success also of a knowledge, knowledge brokering practice. If you have uh, enabled certain kind of attachment, but also detachment. And um, these, these vanishings or disappearances or detachments of knowledge brokers are maybe uh, uh, a common trait of intermediaries more generally. And I just put this one quote, this is a historian of science talking, uh, James Dalbogo, and he says that vanishings are the sure traces of the go-between. And there has been a, a whole book published on the history of, uh, of brokers and intermediaries. And for historians of science, this is a fascinating uh, theme, but it's always very difficult because you get to know the big uh, inventions and the, the important actors, the important scientists and politicians, but all the different uh, kind of work, the translations, the thing you had to put on ships to move between countries, this is often forgotten. And this is where uh, the, the work from historians that can be interesting and, and, and uh, enlightening. So what I want to, to move away is <clears throat> from this kind of idea that you have a broker which is in between worlds. A broker which might be uh, trying to translate uh, knowledge between a user, um, uh, the public of a museum, a politician who, who wants to do a decision, and then uh, the, the, the world of scientists, uh, the, the academic literature, experts or other potential users. And so this is, this is true, this is one way to describe knowledge brokers and this is one movement they themselves uh, uh, think about. But the, 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 the vision I want to offer you as of knowledge broking is a, a, a wider vision, I would, and I would depict it like this. So I would say that knowledge brokering is at least, um, we should understand knowledge brokering as, uh, uh, as a combined effort of four, four uh, trajectories or four movements. So knowledge brokers, first of all, they move into uh, a relationship between different kinds of actors. So um, they get to know the literature, they get to know the experts, they get to know uh, the different users of publics. Uh, then, of course, knowledge brokers also move in between uh, the user and expertise or science. And they do so um, by uh, trying to think what the problem is and what the knowledge need is and what kind of frames are present. But um, also interesting, as I said, is this moving alongside that, that brokers, they work with and walk along with uh, the knowledge users. And they do so by uh, producing documents, by searching for information, uh, by translating this information. And then at the end of the day, uh, it's this idea of moving away and detaching yourself from those actors. So um, you have a more dynamic and more temporal view of knowledge brokering. Uh, yes, they do move in between worlds, but they're also on a temporal trajectory where they move into and move also away from, uh, from actors. And um, while I've, I've talked about knowledge brokering and um, how knowledge brokers move, but one thing which is often left implicit also, if we talk about public understanding of science, um, is that, well, uh, this does not leave unchanged knowledge. So you also transform knowledge. You also work with knowledge. Um, if you are going into a, a museum, if you're going to a science center, uh, what you see is a specific version or a specific articulation of science and knowledge. And it's quite diff different from the knowledge you would see in an academic publication, for example. Um, so, what I want to do is to think about what people do, not only in terms of moving around between worlds and alongside actors, but also how they work, how they work with, and how they transform uh, knowledge. And I'll just show you one, one quote. This is, um, these are knowledge brokers in, in France, so in the, the medical field, um, and they have been also doing uh, knowledge brokering, and so they have try to summarize what knowledge brokering is, and uh, this is just a, a very short abstract. And they said, well, in their eyes, uh, knowledge brokering is, uh, 
means different things. It's collectively collecting and summarizing information, and in that case, it's clinical trial reports. It's scoring and ranking these according to their level of evidence. It means exploring and synthesizing the data using meta-analysis. It means summarizing all these results and all this information they've gathered. It means, it means representing them in an easily understandable form and transmitting the overview findings at the time they need them. So this is not only about taking knowledge which has already been published in a certain form and giving it to people, and especially in the medical field, you can imagine why this is problematic, because doctors, they don't have the time to read the 100 or 200 publications uh, coming out on their specific, uh, on, on specific diseases or, or, or cases they want to treat. And, and it's dif different, difficult also to get to know um, all the data behind uh, the papers, uh, how, how big a population was used to, to produce the results, et cetera, how big the, 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 the clinical trials were, et cetera, and so and how robust and how valid the findings are. And the idea of knowledge brokering is then to, uh, to give to, to doctors, um, for example, or people working in hospitals, some kind of informational idea about um, what uh, medication to give or what, how to improve uh, a service in, 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 a, in a hospital, uh, but what, without them having to go through all the academic literature. And so you see it's much more than just, as I said, giving a, a doctor uh, 10 or uh, 100 academic publications, but it's really transforming this knowledge. So um, I would argue that knowledge brokering is, in fact, multiple practices. It does multiple things with knowledge. So first of all, people try to identify and localize knowledge. They go and look through databases. They call up people. They speak with experts. Um, they do searches on uh, Scopus or uh, Scholar Google. So they try to find and locate information. And then the idea is to redistribute and disseminate knowledge. So um, it means taking the knowledge where it is and giving it um, and moving it to, to other worlds. But it also means, and this is important, to rescale and transform knowledge. So it can be, for example, as they said here, it's producing summaries, it's representing um, the data in easily uh, understandable formats. So you can't have a, an academic paper which has 10 pages and which uses a lot of jargon and which is quite hard to read or takes a lot of effort to read. And, but if you do then this kind of rescaling transformation and summarizing, this might be a way to uh, allow for knowledge to be uh, brokered more uh, efficiently. So knowledge brokering is much more than just the idea of moving knowledge or transferring knowledge. Um, people often use the, those terms knowledge transfer as if knowledge would be pre-existing, uh, ready to be used, and it just needed to be transferred to one place and then used or understood, and that's all. Um, knowledge brokering uh, and in, involves much more practices. So it's um, making knowledge, it's, uh, making knowledge uh, more accessible, more usable, and I would say one way to think about this is to really unpack and problematize what knowledge means. And so this is why I use the term brokered knowledge. And I would say the end result of knowledge brokering, and we can also test this idea in science museums or for science journalists uh, and for science shops, is what kind of knowledge is produced uh, throughout all these uh, practices and all these movements. And the idea uh, I'm, 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 I'm using here is to think of uh, knowledge that has been transformed and translated, and so this is why I use the term brokered knowledge, which I argue is knowledge made more accessible, more accountable, more usable. Um, it is knowledge that serves uh, a, a specific public, that serves sometimes locally a, a specific patient, in, it, in the case of doctors. And it is knowledge that has been deassembled and then reassembled in a specific format. So to finish, I 
I just uh, in the beginning I, I, I put the the one possible Portuguese uh, translation of knowledge brokering uh, as being more uh, more to do with intermediaries or intermediation, and um, and I think this is uh, maybe a better word than brokering because brokering always refers to uh, people doing business and you see people in in suits and ties and being making links between uh, the, pro the the producer of something like. Uh, corn or like uh, uh, like cars, and then people buying these things. And um, intermediation offers another way to think about these practices. So, um, having heard Bruce uh, Levenstein's opening lecture, made me think about the parallels I can offer you um, uh, with what he had to say. So, remember that. He, he had different, well, he had four models, but I just want to pick up two of the models. He said, he talked about the deficit model, so you have uh, uh, a producer of knowledge which is active, which translates and transmits uh, the information, and then you have a passive public which just receives uh, the knowledge. And this is then called the deficit knowledge. Uh, you just pour knowledge into people's brains and then everything uh, go, goes well. And then the other model is where you also think that, well, the, the public, the lay public also has some knowledge. The famous case being Brian Wynne, uh, the, 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 the case he described in, uh, in the UK. And more and more you've, you've got formats where people uh, co-produce knowledge. Um, you've got um, uh, citizen conferences, uh, you've got dialogues. And so the idea is to put the scientists and the, the public on a, on, a more equal, uh, on a more equal scale. And what is sometimes in, what is interesting and what is counterintuitive in his in his talk is that he says, well, the deficit model still makes sense. It has been criticised um, uh, above all in the 80s and 90s, but people still use uh, this model, and it still makes sense for some uh, some issues to try to think of of science in uh, in, in one way as more linear linear. Um, a mode of communicating knowledge, and um, and the the point we can make about knowledge brokering is also somewhat similar. That um, while uh, knowledge brokering is uh, reliant on this idea of moving in between and having people moving between two worlds, but also uh, they also think of knowledge brokering as something more likely. Um, Another way to think about knowledge broking is to think about exploration. So you don't really know where you will end up with. And this is work I'm, I'm, I'm quoting from a, a paper I did with a colleague of mine, Katharina Schliff, and she did her PhD on uh, science shops, on one science shop in, in uh, Spain, in Valencia, and the other one in Denmark, in Copenhagen. And we had a lot of discussions about the similarities between knowledge brokers and science shops. And uh, we, we really got into it, so we thought, well, we have to write a paper together about um, intermediation in these different cases, in the case of science shops and, and knowledge brokers. And, and in a similar way uh, to, to, to Liebenstein, we don't want to dismiss some more linear or more or positivist view of uh, science communication. And in our paper, we are interested in actually the coexistence of different ways to think about communication and knowledge translation. So you have, um, on the one hand, uh, people talking about two worlds, and so these are some, some, some quotes from our interviews. Science shops or knowledge brokers, they, 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 call, they talk of themselves like um, go-betweens. They think of uh, being an interface between the university and civil society or uh, science and, and the medical world. People always refer to gaps and uh, that the idea of, um, of knowledge brokering is to bridge uh, the bridge these gaps or to bridge two cultures or to bridge two solitudes. And this, this repertoire, this way of thinking about knowledge brokering is very much present and is very much uh, alive in, in, in people's practices and in people's discourses. But at the same time, we also see another kind of uh, discourse, another kind of repertoire. And this is the idea that um, 
that knowledge brokering and knowledge translation is not only happening between two worlds, but it's also moving to a, towards a, a new world, and a world which is much more uncertain and um, which still is in the making and, and is being shaped. And so there, if people think about this kind of exploration, future-oriented exploration, um, people talk more about uh, change and that the idea is to facilitate change, to lead to uh, policy decisions, and also walking alongside towards a certain goal or to a certain aim is also, um, we argue, um, uh, is also one way to think of, of knowledge brokering as exploration rather than a movement be between two existing worlds. So um, my, my two final slides, um, I would say it's, it's important to, to take into account the variety and the multiplicity of these movements uh, when people do knowledge brokering. It is, uh, as I said, it is um, reliant upon and it's described as um, a, a movement of going in between worlds, so building bridges and being a conduit between two existing worlds, but also it, it might lead towards new worlds, to, towards a, a world which is still in the making. So, in other words, um, we can think of knowledge brokering as, and the knowledge brokers as intermediaries, as uh, go-betweens, but also um, the, the act of knowledge brokering as a practice which can be described as mediation, so as something which leads towards, towards change. So this is why also I want to come back to the metaphor of bridges. Um, I would say yes, um, the bridge metaphor does make sense, um, but it's also, uh, as every metaphor is, it's always, always also hiding things and silencing things, and it's not a perfect description of what communication and translation and, and brokering is. So, so yes, I would say um, part of what knowledge brokering is is to build a bridge between, uh, between two, two different worlds, but um, the more interesting and more difficult thing is to think about knowledge brokering more uh, like uh, this other picture as a, as, a, as a bridge which is being built and you don't know exactly where this bridge will end up. And this is the, the, the final picture I wanted to, to, to show you. And so I say again, thanks. I hope this is a, a good translation. Uh, thanks to Google Translate for this. <laughs> So thank you for your beautiful speech. I love when people can say what I think in a so clear way and so clear words, so thank you. Um, I think this talk is very important because um, I've been talking in the coffee breaks with lots of people and I think uh, one conclusion that uh, I can reach uh, from these long coffee breaks that we had is uh, our community, people that are here see today, need to think um, about uh, what we do, think about who we are, and think about us as a group, and I think knowledge brokering is a good start to think about that. So uh, I would like to open the discussion to all of you. If you have questions to uh, Morgan, please say something. There, there are two questions, Rishkad Nunes there and someone here. Some more there. Yeah, I see, but <laughs> okay. Thank you very much for this very enlightening uh, uh, talk. And uh, I, have, I have two questions. The first is the following. 
Uh, when you talk about uh, knowledge brokers, the first thing you tend to think of is that uh, direction of the brokering <laughs> is from uh, the knowledge produced by, by scientists, experts, professionals, etc., towards those who are in some, in some way the recipients or the, those interested in using this kind of knowledge. But um, it would be interesting to think the other way around as well. That is that knowledge brokers are also those who are able to, um, to draw on, on local knowledge and local experience in order to, to, to build the, the kind of, uh, of knowledge and competences that are necessary for this, uh, this traveling and, and moving of, uh, of, uh, and reconfiguring of the knowledge to, to happen. Uh, could you please tell us something about that? And the, the, second, the second question has to do with um, with brokering as either, is, is it or should it be seen as a kind of individual uh, activity or should we all also start to think, for instance, your, your, your reference to science shops actually raises the, the question, should you think of brokering as a kind of uh, activity that requires some, some assemblage, some, some kind of uh, agencement, as you would say in French, in order to make it viable and also to, to, to create some kind of, um, of, of anchoring of it in order mm -hmm. for, for it to be, to be pursued without all the, the contingencies of, uh, of this kind of individual work. Thanks for, for the questions. Uh, the first question, yes, um, I think science shops are a good example where you have uh, knowledge flows in both directions because um, uh, often what happens with science shops that you have the local community, they have a problem about uh, traffic or pollution or there's a specific uh, thing they want to know or a specific solution they want to find uh, to, to uh, deal with uh, environmental problems or, or pollution problems. And so um, what often happens is that you have the science shop um, listening to what um, the, the civil society, what the local community has to say and trying to find ways to turn this question into a research question or a science question. So, and it's interesting because the problem is a local problem, it is a real problem, it is a, a problem linked to, to, to a community, and then uh, it is transformed into a project and often you would have either master students or uh, a PhD students doing a small project and writing a report. Uh, so it's at once doing scientific work but also responding to a specific need and it's always going backwards and forwards to, to, to link the community's needs and their need for knowledge to what scientists can offer at a university. Um, the second question, um, yes, I think I would argue that we, we should think, we should have a wide and open definition of what knowledge brokers are. It can be individuals, and uh, I showed you some pictures that there are people who call themselves knowledge brokers, um, at this conference in London three years ago, there were 200 people attending. Um, it can be individual people, but often these people say, "What I do uh, when I do knowledge broken, this is only 50% or 60% of what I, re uh, what I do, and I do lots of other stuff." So it's uh, maybe half an individual, if you if you, if you will. But my, my view is that it's something individuals do. It's something that institutions uh, or specific places do, like. Uh, science shops or technology transfer offices and it's also a thing which is done materially or with specific tools and this is something I'm working on uh, at the moment to think of brokering not only uh, on an individual and institutional level but also look at brokering devices so um, organizing a conference or uh, having people get together uh, doing uh, wikis or etc these are also a way for people to work together so you know, it's, it's, for me, it's also important to think of the materiality and the devices of knowledge brokering. Okay. Okay. There is a question here and two somewhere there. Okay. Let's uh, put together some, some questions, you and some of behind there. Hi, uh, thanks for your talk. Um, um, I'm a design writer and researcher and critic, and I couldn't help myself to hear your talk and I must say I had never heard the term knowledge broker before. And it was interesting how at some point you, there's even a quote that you say that knowledge broker should be representing the result in an easy, easily understandable form 
and transmitting the overview findings at the time they need them. This is kind of what a designer does. Um, what is what designers do, especially information designers, communication designers, visual uh, visual um, uh, complexity people who work with data visualization, but also service designers. So my question is, how is design part of this of your research or the knowledge broker community, and should it be? I think so. Thanks. Yeah. There were two more there. You? Hi, uh, I would like to ask you something related to the question that uh, the colleague asked now. If you would need to make a list of examples of professions uh, that are uh, in, inside this concept of knowledge brokering, could you give us a few examples? And my, the second part of my question is that do, the, do these functions already exist in institutions and uh, or are they new functions or new uh, uh, it's uh, new um, needs from the institutions well, let's answer right down to this otherwise you okay yeah, yeah. Uh, the quick answer to design is no. Um, well, I haven't really thought about the ratio between design and knowledge broking, so, so thanks for the idea. Um, but there are a lot of parallels you can do. You can also see consultancy work as one kind of knowledge brokering. And, um, and maybe design is much more reflective and much more uh, uh, programmatic and much more uh, ingrained already in institutions and in curriculum, whereas knowledge brokering tends to happen more on an ad hoc basis. and it's, is more emerging and, and, and less visible. You don't have degrees in knowledge brokering as you would have in, in design, for example. And um, a list of professions and, and, and the need of knowledge brokering. Um, I think um, one way to think of it is that since the 1980s, you have a lot of emphasis put on uh, making knowledge usable and uh, making it profitable. And people talk about mode two knowledge production, so you don't have science which is only done in, in, in scientific silos or in academia, but you have to make uh, knowledge socially robust as well. So it has to offer a certain kind of function. And all other people talk about the triple helix, so you have the ratio between the government, the industry, and, and, and science. And so we have a, um, a need or a push from government, from industrial actors, from NGOs to make science more open or accessible or more usable to different kind of actors. Um, and so maybe this is one way to explain why there is a perceived need in universities, but also in other places, to make knowledge more uh, accessible and usable for, for different kinds of, of actors. I think it's, knowledge broken itself is perhaps not that new. You, you, a lot of people, when I give talks about knowledge broken, say, well, that's what I do uh, every day, or I haven't heard the term since now, but everything you explain, that's also what I do. But um, one change is that maybe it's becoming more and more institutionalized. If you see conferences, if you see newsletters, if you see job posts at universities, um, if you see people building forums to share best practices, that's one argument. Uh, the argument to make then is that, well, it's something which is becoming more and more professionalized and institutionalized, especially since the last, uh, I would say, 15, 10, 20 years. OK, there was, thank you. Two more questions there, at least. One there, yeah. Hi, uh, thank you for this presentation. Uh, there is something that uh, I quite not, did not understand. It's like since there is no studies to become uh, knowledge brokers, who are those people? What are uh, their backgrounds? And um, for who they are, like for who they are working? You talked about being um, a consult consultant, but uh, is there an institution in which it's already considered uh, being a professional job? Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh no, thank you. And there was another one here, I thought, was Manella, no, 
uh, yeah, somewhere. Yeah. Hi. Oops. Thank you, Morgan, for your enticing um, presentation. And I think I go in line with both what the designer said and the question that was raised behind. I couldn't stop myself from thinking of the paradigm of the curator while I was listening to your presentation. And maybe that goes already. Maybe somebody already t told you that. A few years ago, I think it was an area of, uh, or a field of knowledge, as now is established, that didn't have an anchor. They, they, were no, they were not considered professionals, or more or less, they were paid, but badly. Uh, and they, were, they didn't have uh, an established practice, like they didn't have a school to attend to. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, it is, but they knew they exist, and they were important. And I couldn't stop thinking that what you describe as broker, uh, knowledge broker, is somebody that is framing some kind of knowledge that is there, but it's not fixed, and is in constant flux, and it depends on very many different levels. And then you just mediate and in, in, in kind of, you do a framing, but you also do a media to present to another audience that might change also. So it's not something that is fixed, and I, I couldn't, I just would like to, to see your reaction to this idea of the curator that now has a curatorial practice behind and has established um, college degrees. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Um, the first question, who are these knowledge brokers? Um, they come from all kinds of backgrounds. Um, the person I showed you in the beginning uh, at the University of Leeds, uh, Vicky Ward, she uh, used to teach uh, music, uh, saxophone and clarinet, and then she moved to, to do knowledge brokering. But often you would have people who have a degree in science, uh, chemistry, biology, or whatever, and then they move to do things to do with outreach or science communication. Sometimes it's people who have do two degrees, but you would have, there is no typical knowledge broker. So it's people who come from different, different backgrounds. Um, the biggest concentration or the biggest habitat of knowledge brokers would be, I would say, Canada and the UK. And there you have people who work as knowledge brokers and who are paid to do knowledge brokering. Um, uh, for example, if, if you're interested, you can read the papers by Christine Knight. Uh, her name is at the, the bottom there, Christine uh, Knight. And she was paid by the University of Edinburgh to work as a knowledge broker. Um, and they had workshops, and they had um, conferences, and they, they wrote um, uh, reports about knowledge brokering. So um, I, I, I couldn't say how many knowledge brokers there are actually in the world, but I would say there are a couple of, say between 200 and 1,000 is a, uh, a, a one estimate, uh, one potential estimate. Um, the, the relationship between museums is a very good question because I had one bonus slide, and so now I can show that, um, which is this one. Um, and if I would have two hours, then I would have talked about science museums and science communication. And I, I um, but I, I'll, first I explain some some background. I, I pretty much agree that yes, uh, what. Um, museums do or what curators do when they do an exhibition is uh, framing knowledge or presenting knowledge or using different kinds of media, objects, videos, panels, text to make knowledge understandable and accessible for a wider public. And, um, and this is, yeah, knowledge broking works also as one way to think about what science centers and, and, and museums do. And I did one, um, I did one paper uh, a few years ago about uh, this kind of device, which I found really interesting. And this is at the Deutsches Museum in, in Munich. So it's a, a, a technical museum, but it's also got uh, stuff on nanotechnology and, and, and biotechnology. And they've um, created this laboratory a few years ago called the Open Research Laboratory, in German, Gläsernes uh, Forscher Labor. So that the German idea is that you have something which is made out of glass, so you can really see. Uh, and so this is a lab we, where you have uh, uh, master students, uh, doctoral students, and, and postdocs. They work and they do uh, their PhDs, their research project, but it is in the museum. And um, 
for the scientists, the scientists also change when they are put in the museum. So they are in a museum, so they are almost on display like any other object, and they have got to cope with people watching them and with the noise and with access, with opening hours. Um, but also they have got to think about how to communicate knowledge. And so they've got, and this is one thing they really find interesting is, well, we, can, we cannot only write papers and give, give talks to our peers and academic audiences, but we have to make things more simple and understandable and we've got to use some objects or videos to show things. And we've got to explain what research means. It's not only publishing the results, but uh, what does it take to be a researcher? Um, how much do you earn? Uh, uh, how sometimes it's frustrating? Why is it frustrating? Uh, what are your personal choices? And so um, the, the, the scientists work there, they also change. And their PhD, for example, if they do a PhD in this uh, space, Part of it is related to science communication and public understanding of science, and part is the experiment per se, and in this case, it's, it's, it's nanotechnology. And for the visitors, this is also interesting because it changes a bit how they normally engage with the museum. In a museum, they are more uh, used to seeing objects and things, but not really people. It's not really like a, like a zoo, almost. Um, so. They find it interesting, but sometimes it's difficult to get them to ask questions to those people in this, uh, in this device. And so there is still a distance. Um, the, the visitors, they can't uh, go inside the lab. They're just outside of the lab. Um, you've got to encourage them to ask, uh, to ask questions. So sometimes they would put up signs which says, OK, questions allowed, or please do ask questions. And this is a very interesting device because it is um, Science is framed, as you would say, differently. It is the laboratory is changed. It is uh, not behind the walls of university, but in an, a public uh, space like a museum. And people have got the scientists have got to learn how to communicate science to the public, and the public has got to think of ways to ask questions or interact with the, the scientists working there. Okay, I think we don't have uh, more time because it's. Our just ended. Thank you for coming and thank you all uh, for being here. And I close this session. <laughs> <laughs>